talk um, at a more kind of practical level. I'm going to talk about reasoning techniques, but I'm mostly going to do it by example and not go into too much technical details about formalisms and so on. So sometimes, <coughs> sorry, sometimes I'll show kind of things written up on the screen in slightly formal notation, which I won't always fully explain, but I'll just sort of give you verbally an idea what it, it all means. Okay, so let's just get into it and see how we, how we manage. And just shout out, stick a hand up, um, whatever, if you have any questions as we go along. So, um, well, the motivation behind what I'm going to tell you about is um, this whole big data thing that we hear a huge amount about these days. So there's massive quantities of data, ever-increasing, uh, and what are we going to do with that? How are we going to process it? There are numerous problems to be dealt with in this space, but one of the, one, one of the interesting ones, one of the ones I'm particularly interested in anyway, is the difficulty of even identifying the right bit of this information that you really need in this huge ocean of, of data. And um, probably you've seen many variations on this kind of, uh, you know, big data, uh, different kinds of problems associated with big data. Um, and there are all kinds of different problems, as I was saying. There's just the sort of volume problem. So there's a, it's big, there's a hell of a lot of it. Uh, velocity, so streaming data is sometimes arriving at a uh, you know, very high rate. So how can you keep pace with the... How can the processing keep pace with this date at the rate that the data is arriving at? And then what I'm more interested at here, uh, in here are these problems of variety and complexity. So the data very often comes from multiple different sources, has many different structures, and how do you manage to sort of integrate all that into some uh, form that you can then do some processing on? So all of that's very kind of abstract. So I just wanted to give you an example of a, of a concrete case study coming from a, an EU research project that we are working in. So the background to this is that um, industry has been gathering data for a very long time and of course this data tends to have a very messy and heterogeneous structure because you have all kinds of different corporate data stores where data has been put in there for decades uh, and they employ for example people like engineers who want to try and get at this data and utilize it for uh, various different, uh, improving various different processes within the company. They're typically not IT experts, so the people who want to use the data are not able to do things like write SQL queries or anything like that. So typically what they have is some application that provides access to the data for them. And what that usually does, actually somewhere buried in this application, there is a sort of library of predefined queries that retrieve data from the store and present it back to the user in a way that they can, uh, they can then use it. If the predefined queries don't actually cover the case that the user uh, that, that, that the user needs, so they're not able to access the data that they want to access. So even though they somehow know that that data is sitting there in the data stores, then the usual routine is that they have to go to the IT department and say, well, the, you know, the standard interface tool that I have doesn't support what I'm trying to do. And then what typically happens is that some person in the IT department produces a new query and adds that to the tool. But that's quite a time-consuming process. So one of the use case partners in this project I was talking about is Statoil. That's the uh, Norwegian national oil company. And, uh, and we were work working with the exploration department there where they have um, 900 geologists and geophysicists and they are trying to decide where might be a good place in the North Sea to explore for oil. 
Now, obviously, going out into the North Sea with an oil rig and drilling a hole down somewhere to find out what's really down there is incredibly expensive. So the most that you can do to exploit the data that you have to try to look in the most promising places, it's really important because that's going to save you millions or, or even billions of dollars. So they have all these people that are trying to exploit data, and this data is incredibly heterogeneous. It comes from previous drilling operations, it comes from satellite data, it comes from all kinds of different places, and it's sitting in all kinds of different data stores, thousands of different tables in multiple different databases, all with different schemas, different structures of the data. And they use a system very like the one I was describing, where they have a, an interface tool that basically just has predefined queries that gets them back some piece of tabular data that they're interested in. And they can then use lots of different kinds of simulation tools, other kinds of uh, tools that they use for uh, trying to decide you know, what the likelihood of, of uh, oil or gas being trapped underneath some kind of rock layer below the uh, uh, surface of the ocean. And they spend, although these guys uh, are geologists and geophysicists, uh, they actually end up spending at least half of their time just trying to get hold of the data rather than really doing something sensible with the data, you, you know, exploiting their enormous expertise. They're actually wasting a huge amount of their time trying to just find the data that they need to look at. And if they, if they need to add a new query to the system, it typically takes about four days to turn that around via the IT department, which is often too slow. Because although you might think that there's a huge uh, you know, amount of planning goes into one of these operations, actually quite often what happens is the management comes along and says, oh, we need to decide you know, within the next 24 hours whether we're going to put in a bid for some you know, new drilling area in the North Sea and you know, tell me what you reckon the chances are that that's a, a promising area. Another uh, use case partner we have that has a similar uh, kind of uh, problem but also with some subtle differences is Siemens. And in, in the case of Siemens, uh, they have, um, we're working with the, the department that services and maintains um, turbine power generation equipment that Siemens sells. And the way this works these days is quite interesting. The, the business model that they have is uh, that anything from they may sell these turbines to some power generation company, or sometimes they even just lease them these days. And they typically have some service contract that says that unless the machine is online and producing power for 99.5% of the time, then there's a penalty against Siemens and they, you know, lose, they lose a lot of money. So they have to make sure that these things are working really reliably. And to do that, they have lots of sensors on the equipment and they stream the data from these sensors actually to centralized um, data centers. There's several of them scattered around Europe, one in the UK. And the, at these centers, they have engineering experts who look at all this data streaming in. Currently, the way things mainly work is that when there's a problem on site, they call up the service center and ask for some help in fixing that. And the engineers at the service center look at the data from the turbine that came in before the fault occurred, and they use that to try to figure out what's going wrong. What they'd really like to do in the future is really anticipate faults by seeing this data streaming live, seeing that the, the turbine is vibrating in some funny way or it's too hot or something like that. And then they can see there's going to be a problem there. You should shut it down and perform some maintenance on it before it actually breaks uh, because this is much more economical. Okay, so... What are the, so 
they also have this problem of a lot of heterogeneous, a lot of heterogeneity in the data. <clears throat> and you might wonder why that is. But, I mean, actually, the world's really a complicated, messy place. Sometimes when they sell the uh, turbines to customers, they sell it with Siemens sensors. But not always. Sometimes the customer actually buys the turbine from Siemens and the sensors from somebody else. Uh, quite often, there's some localized pre-processing of the data that goes on before it's shipped off to the service center. And these systems can also be different across different customers. The sensors that, was, that were on the machine when it was shipped break and they get replaced with new ones that have different improved functionality, but then they produce a different kind of data. So all of this data that's coming to the service centers is actually really messy. And again, they would like to try to pre-process that into some homogeneous structure so that it's easier for the engineers to an analyze it. So in both cases, and in many different similar problems, um, the idea is to use some sort of semantic technology to try to um, ease this problem of heterogeneity of the data. And the idea there is to use some sort of rich conceptual schema, a model of the world, a nice, clean model of the world that we can use to integrate all of this messy data and somehow present it to the user as though it has a clean and uniform structure. So the idea is that these models are user-centric. So unlike in a database so where the schema usually a lot of it just reflects how we want to physically store the data. So the schema talks about tables and you know just exactly the structure we're putting the data in. In semantic technologies, the schema is more abstract and more user-centric. So it's a sort of model of the world that reflects the structure of the world that you know someone like a geologist might expect to see. So it talks about strata and, and you know, rock types and all of these sorts of things that geologists are familiar with and not tables that um, you know, are storing the data in the, in the physical system. Uh, so conceptual schemas in semantic technologies are also declarative. And what I mean by that is that they, they state facts about the world, but they don't, again, they're independent of the sort of computational system. They don't say anything about how you would actually do any computation with these facts. That's taken care of by um, a reasoning system. They have a formal semantics, so the meaning of these schemas is very precise, and that has advantages in that we that we don't have to you know negotiate amongst ourselves about what the meaning is that's formally specified by the semantics and also this formal and precise semantics is essential if we're going to do machine processing of the data so if we want to write a program that says, OK, here's some data, and here's a conceptual schema. Now can you answer a question for me that reflects both the data and what it says in this conceptual schema? In order to be able to write such a program, I have to first know exactly what the meaning of this conceptual schema is. Otherwise, how can I know what the right answer is? And so how should I know what my program ought to do? And, well, we can do lots, of, if we have such a rich conceptual schema with formal semantics, we can do lots of nice things with that. I was talking about computation already. What, what, do I, what sorts of computation might we want to carry out? What might we want to do? Well, we can do things like check the validity and the consequences of the design. So I can check that all of these declarative statements I made about the structure of the world are at least consistent amongst themselves. I didn't say, you know, over here one thing and over there another thing that are completely conflicting and that means that I can deduce some uh, logical inconsistency. And I can use the schema to make it easier to formulate queries so the users can ask queries using vocabulary that they're familiar with and with respect to some sort of model of the world that is targeted at the users. Um, 
Uh, and we can also use the schema to enrich query answers, so to provide answers to queries that reflect our knowledge of the world as well as just the, the facts that we have. So the conceptual schemas that we use in semantic technology are typically based on this OWL ontology language, which hopefully some of you at least may have heard of. And it has all of the nice features that I was just describing. It's declarative. It has a clear semantics. It has well-understood computational properties. In fact, uh, I think in the introduction, um, you were saying that description logic is a kind of extension of modal logic. Uh, to be honest, these days I prefer to say that it's a subset of first-order logic. So it's just um, a, a decidable subset of familiar first-order logic that hopefully that you all have learned about in various different courses. And it's a subset that's chosen so as to at least be decidable and hopefully to have some reasonable computational properties with respect to complexity. Well, the decidability part we, we nailed, so we, by choosing a description logic, it's, a, it's definitely a decidable subset, but unfortunately the complexity side isn't looking so good because actually the complexity class for this description logic that um, OWL is based on is double non-deterministic exponential time. So while well, those of you are not so familiar with complexity, um, what I can tell you is that's quite bad because it means as the size of the data increases, then the, um, the, the time it takes to answer queries can you know, shoot off into space in next to no time. In contrast with databases, they have actually what a complexity class called AC0, but this is inside logarithmic space. And what that means is that databases have this nice feature that as you get more and more data, then the time it takes to answer queries can increase you know, reasonably quickly at the beginning, but it sort of plateaus so that at some point, you know, you can add more and more and more data and it hardly gets any more difficult, hardly takes any more time at all to answer queries. And obviously this is a nice behavior and this is an, a nasty behavior. And, I mean, you have to understand that this complexity class doesn't mean that that will always happen. You know, that's a worst case result. What it tells us is that could happen. And typically what we observe in practice with these very... Um, nasty complexity classes is not really, you know, that behavior. What we, be, what we observe is brittleness of the systems. So everything's working great. We have our data. We have our ontology. We're asking questions. It's working. Everything's working perfectly. And then we make some tiny little change over there. We add one little piece of information. And all of a sudden, the performance just falls off a cliff. I, I, I asked the same question I was asking a minute ago. Everything was working fine. I changed one thing, asked the question again, and the, the little wheel just starts spinning around and it, and it never comes back. And, and that's not a very nice behavior um, when people are trying to use these systems. So, yeah, we get lots of nice stuff from these semantic systems, but no free lunch you know, potentially it has a, a high computational cost. So can we do anything about that? So it would be nice to have this kind of a system, but can we provide a practical one that people can really use in the sorts of um, applications that I was describing in the motivation? So, well, when OWL was originally defined, um, we knew about this high complexity, but actually not much was done about it within the specification of the language. And then after it had been around for about five years, I think, there was a revision of the standard called OWL2. And actually one of the main things that was introduced in OWL2 were what the W3C calls language profiles, which are three identified subsets of the full language that have reduced expressive power, of course, but 
um, much better computational properties. And one of these is a language called L2QL. So this was QL stands for query language. So the reason it was called that was that this profile was specifically intended for applications where there would be a large amount of data. And the main computational task that you would be performing was answering queries over the data, but also taking into account some ontology written in this ontology language. And uh, it was based on a description logic called DL Lite. And the, the, the thing about DL Lite, actually it has a, a, a very good computational properties, the same as databases, in fact. Uh, and the reason for that is that reasoning in DL Lite can be efficiently implemented via rewriting into relational queries, which is a, a technique now known as OBDA, ontology-based data access. And I'm going to explain uh, by example how ontology-based data access works. So let's imagine we have one of our um, Statoil engineers over here who has a question. I, because I don't understand that much about geology, uh, and because I have to fit all this onto a slide, I'm going to choose a, a rather silly and very simple question, but just for the sake of example, let's say this person wants to uh, retrieve from the database the names of all of those pipelines that are coming from oil facilities. Okay, so let's just assume, and of course this isn't realistic, but I'll come back to the, this part of the, of the problem a bit later. Let's just assume actually that this engineer is able to formalize the query in some kind of a query language that a computer could, that you could type into a computer. Now I didn't use SQL over here, I used a more sort of abstract query language, but basically what's happening here is I have various different parts to my query which consist of patterns and I have some parts of the pattern that are wild cards. They have a question mark there. And the answers to the query basically consist of patterns in the data that I can superimpose onto that. And, that, and then the, the places that identify with the wild cards, I may or may not return those as part of my answer. But you can, uh, hopefully you can see how this corresponds to the question. It says, give me all those X such that X has type pipeline, X comes from some facility Y, and Y has type oil facility, okay? So that's just a way of writing down in some logical formalism this question. And let's also assume that we have our data already sitting in some nice semantic technology data store where it's already in the form of these kind of little uh, factoids that in semantic technology we like to call triples because each one of them has three components, a subject, a predicate and an object and they say things like well pipeline P1 is of type, well sorry P1 is of type pipeline, P1 comes from facility F1, F1 has type oil facility and so on. So we just have all of these little bits of facts obviously in practice, there would be billions of these to process, but I haven't got space on the slide for billions, so I'll, I'll just show you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we want to ask this question over that data, and we're looking for patterns that, that match this query, and we come back, actually, it's fairly easy to see that the answer P1 comes back, because... P1 has type pipeline, so that matches with this. P1 comes from facility F1, so that matches with this. And F1 has type oil facility, so that matches with this. So the Y here matches with F1, and the X matches with P1. And so I end up returning the answer P1. Okay? Actually, the user... Whoops. The user here is a bit puzzled and dissatisfied with that answer because anybody 
think why the user isn't really happy with that answer? Yeah, because the user was thinking, I'm sure there were more than one pipeline that comes from oil facilities in there. And in fact, if they looked at the data themselves, they would see, uh, oh, P2 is of type oil pipeline and comes from facility F2, which is an oil facility. So that should have been in the answer, surely, shouldn't it? And, you know, similarly for P3. But they didn't come back in the answer because... Yeah, it's the wrong type. Yeah, I mean, actually, I didn't say that P1, uh, sorry, that P2 is of type pipeline. I said it's of type oil pipeline. Okay? And as we all know, you know, this is a computer here that's doing this. Computers are really stupid, and they, oil, to them, oil pipeline and pipeline are just two completely different and totally unconnected things. They've no idea about that, unless we tell them something. Okay, so what we can do to tell them some of this kind of stuff is we can add an ontology. So this is one statement in an owl, one statement in an owl ontology that captures actually the information we need to know in order to get the answer that we're really looking for, which says that an oil pipeline, again, don't worry about the, the exact syntax here, it's just not important to what I'm trying to explain today. This says an oil pipeline is a pipeline that comes from an oil facility. Okay, that's all it says in that statement. It says it in a sort of formal language um, so that we can then use that for processing. So imagine if we could use this as well as, so if we can use this background knowledge as well as the data that we have to answer this query, then we can certainly get the, the right answer. But how can we do that? How can we use this ontology and the data computationally? How can we do that? And even more, how can we do it in an efficient way? So I could, one thing I could certainly do is I could get my you know, favorite first order theorem prover like vampire or something, and I could you know, just write all this stuff down in first order logic put all this lot in there as ground facts in first order logic and, you know, do some theorem proving and get the answer to pop out. But the chance of that being able to scale to billions or even trillions of facts here is not very great. So I'd like some better computational method than that. Well, if this is an L2QL ontology, I can exploit this query rewriting technique that I was mentioning to you before. So what we do there actually is we use the ontology to rewrite the original query into a, a larger query that takes into account the information that's in the ontology and does it in a very clever way such that it's guaranteed that the answer to this expanded query over the data is exactly the same as I would have got if I'd really done this kind of theorem proving technique and answered the question with respect to both the data and the ontology. And in this case, the rewriting is actually pretty simple. What I actually do is, and I mean in general what this rewriting does is, it expands the query by adding extra queries. So I, have a, I end up with this or here, it's a union query, so my x comes back in the answer either if it matches my original query or if it matches this second query that I added, which just says it's of type oil pipeline. Okay? And if I ask this query now against the data without even bothering with the ontology, I get the, the correct answer. Okay. Unfortunately, in reality, of course, the data probably isn't actually sitting in one of these nice semantic stores. It's actually sitting in some relational database that's been there for the last 20 years or something. And it's sitting there in a table like this. So, well, what can I do about that? Well, there's another kind of semantic technology already around that actually provides a mapping language that tells me how I can take data from a relational database, suck it out, 
and put it into one of these triple stores. And this is a, a language called R2RML, and basically all I do there is I define a bunch of mappings which consist of relational queries over the data, the answer to which is either the extension of um, one of these unary predicates like oil pipeline or a binary predicate like from facility. So these are concepts, these are relations. So I ask a query that either instantiates a concept, so that's like a single column full of facts, or instantiates a relationship, and that's a binary column, a binary table. And I can do, so I can do that. I just define the queries that suck out the uh, information for oil pipeline, which just says select ID from pipeline where oil equals Y. So I'd get P2 and I'd get P3 as oil pipelines, and I'd shove them in over here and so on for the rest of the stuff. But that actually isn't very satisfactory, or at least you know it may be undesirable for a variety of reasons. In practice. You know, the, the management may be unhappy about me sucking all of this data out of their, you know, extremely valuable resources. They may be willing to give me query access to that, but they may not want to just give me the whole data set and let me do what I like with it. And also, it may very well be the case that these databases over here are still active, so they're constantly changing and being augmented. So if I run this process, which can be quite expensive, to move all the data over here, then when it changes over here, I have to keep doing it again and again, and I may be out of date, I may be processing stale data over here, so that's not so good. But actually, the nice thing is that because all we're really doing here is asking a query, we're not doing any clever reasoning actually anymore. We did all the clever reasoning back here when we did the rewriting. All we're doing is asking a query pretty much the same as we would do over here. I can use these R2L, R2 RML mappings kind of backwards and instead of sucking the data out of there, I can take the query and substitute Everywhere where I see oil pipeline, say, I can just substitute the query I got over here that tells me how to get that out of the database. So I can actually use these mappings to rewrite the query a second time and transform it from a query over the um, RDF data store into a query directly over the database. And then what I'll get here is just one of these union SQL queries. So this first part is just exactly the SQL version of that. And the second part is the SQL version of this extra query that I added when I did the rewriting using the ontology, which is just select ID from pipeline where oil equals Y. Okay, once I've done that, actually now I have a query, I can just execute that over the database using my existing uh, relational database query engine and the answer will pop directly out of the database, exactly the answer that the user was looking for. Great. Problem solved, it's all nice and simple. We can leave our data in our existing stores. It, it has very nice computational properties. The management's happy because we don't tell them they have to throw away their ex existing relational data stores. You know, everything's perfect. Well, oh, I'm just, this was just a sort of more formal version of that which I'm gonna skip over because time's a bit short. So, Oh, and the other thing I was going to show you was just the sort of full architecture of the system that we built to do this in practice because I skipped over a little bit at the beginning where, which was the actual query formulation part. So, of course, the user can't really write a query like that one I was showing you, so we give them a nice graphical query formulation tool. This middle bit here is where is what I was showing you on the previous slide. So this is where all the rewriting and query answering, query processing really goes on. Luckily, you'll be glad to know, I bet you were getting a bit worried about our poor friend, the IT expert, thinking the poor guy was going to be out of a job. But actually, that isn't the case. They just changed their job. So instead of 
you know, responding to end user requests for writing new queries. They spend their time maintaining and extending the ontology and the mappings according to how, you know, what new data sources might come along and so on. Uh, and yes, this just explains again how the whole business works. So in this top half of the, uh, of the, of the blue box, we're doing stuff that's computationally expensive. We're doing the query rewriting part, which could be exponential actually, but it's using only, it's independent of the data. So it's using only the ontology and the mappings. So although it's potentially exponential, it's exponential with respect to a relatively small thing. And once we've done the rewriting, we do the evaluation down here. And now we have huge amounts of data, but we're doing the query evaluation completely using relational technology, which is scalable. It has this nice logarithmic feature that we were looking at. So, yes, back to where I was before, which is, so we solved all problems. You know, we've solved world hunger. Everything's good. Uh, unfortunately, not quite. Uh, so I just mentioned something that perhaps sort of I could have snuck by you if I if I wanted to, but I'll come back and draw your attention to it, which is the rewriting can be exponential in the size of the ontology. So the ontology relative to the data is you know not so huge, but even so, if we get this exponential query blow up that can really kill the relational database. So actually relational databases are designed on an assumption that the query isn't so large. And if you end up getting these queries with thousands of, of union queries joined together, that will kill most existing relational database systems. We've got this new mapping thing, which, well, they can be difficult to develop and maintain. We don't know so much about that. And the third thing that's a problem is expressivity. So um, in order to get this um, AC0 complexity class and allow query rewriting to work, we really have to rein in the expressive power of the, of the ontology language. And, and actually, really to an unacceptable extent in many applications. So there are so many things we can no longer say. We can no longer talk about functionality or transitivity. That all went. We can no longer talk about universal restrictions. I mean, you probably you don't know so much about the language, so not all of this means anything to you. But you'll just have to take my word for it that the resulting language you get is, is very... Uh, very weak and often you just can't express what you want to express about the domain using that language. So where can we go? Well I mentioned um, just time checking yeah okay getting near the end now um, I mentioned at the beginning that with three of these languages not just the L2QL one and the second language that was defined is one called L2RL which is based on a sort of intersection between description logics and a language called Datalog, which was developed in the, in the database community, and that can also be potentially efficiently implemented. And there's another one called L2EL, which I probably won't have time to say much about. So the idea with this L2RL language is that it can be efficiently implemented via a process called materialization. So this is a different kind of reasoning process, which again, I'm going to very quickly explain to you how that works just by an example. Here, what we do is we start off with our original data and then instead of rewriting the query using the ontology, we use the ontology to rewrite the data. Okay, so instead of rewriting the query, we rewrite the data. And what I mean by rewriting the data is, again, like with the query rewriting, we extend the data. So we don't throw anything away, we add new stuff. New facts that are entailed by the ontology get added to the database. And then when we've done that, we can ask our query over this expanded database and we get the answer out. So how does that work? Well, let's just imagine I have an ontology. I'm afraid, sorry, I've flipped the notation here 
to the, the description logic style because it fits a bit more easily on the slide. But this is another one of these declarative statements that says oil equipment has every kind, every piece of oil equipment has a part. All, sorry, all of its parts are also oil equipment. Okay, so if, it, if it's a thing is a piece of oil equipment, and all all of its parts are also oil equipment, and you can't express that in L2 uh, QL, and the reason you can't express it is because anyone care to hazard a guess why it can't be expressed in L2 QL? It's probably a bit of a tricky question. But the reason is because this is a recursive statement. Okay? The right hand side mentions again the thing that I started with on the left hand side. So potentially, you know, if I have X is a, has a part Y and Y has a part Z and Z has a part blah blah, then this can cause kind of inferences about oil equipment to kind of move along this chain of parts and holes. An arbitrary distance, I don't know how far, depends on my data. It depends how long these part whole chains might go on for. And you can't do that in an SQL query. That's one of the things you can't do, right? You, you can do a fixed length kind of part whole query, but not arbitrary length. Okay, and if I have a database that says A is a kind of oil equipment, A has part B and B has part C, well, you can see what ought to happen here. You know, given my axiom here, then I should deduce that B is also a kind of oil equipment, and now that I know that, I should be able to use this to deduce that C is also a kind of oil equipment. But obviously, if I ask my query over the original data, again, I'm only going to get a partial answer. I'll just get A, because that's the only thing that I know, according to the data alone, is oil equipment. But if I treat this axiom as a, as a rule, so I can write it down in this form, which is exactly equivalent, this is just a data log rule that captures that. If X is oil equipment, X has part Y, then Y is oil equipment. Okay, I can, what materialization does is it just exhaustively applies this rule to the data to generate new facts, which is exactly as we would expect. It applies it to A and has part AB to derive all equipment B. It then uses that fact along with this fact to derive all equipment C. And then I'm done. I can't derive any new facts. So no more applications of this rule will extend the database, so I can stop. And now I can just ask the query against this extended database, and I get the answer that I was looking for. Okay? So that's how materialization works. And again, it's not an ad hoc process, providing I stick with this data log language, and I mean, the way in which rules are applied is you know, perhaps a little bit more complicated if you look into the details. But, you know, it's pretty much like I was describing here. Uh, I, a, I can guarantee I'll always terminate because um, I'll always get to the stage where I've derived... Um, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is I can derive every single fact for every single individual in my database and then I'm done. There's absolutely nothing else I can do after that. So I'm, I must stop at some stage. And when I stop, I'll have enough information over here to correctly answer all possible queries. Okay, this is again not without its issues. It hasn't got the same very nice logarithmic complexity that that um, databases have got. It's got polynomial complexity. Well, in computer science, we usually say, you know, polynomial means efficiently implementable. But even so, if you're talking about huge data sets, and, you know, how big is this polynomial? Is it quadratic? Is it cubic? Is it something worse than that? It could still take time. So is it efficiently implementable in practice? Remember that in the rewriting technique, we had this nice feature. We could leave data where it was in the relational database. But this is different. I'm going to actually use a semantic store now to do this materialization. So I have to do the sucking the data out. So how am I going to deal with that? And in particular, 
what about, you know, addition is fairly easy, so if I add some stuff to my database, I hope it's reasonably easy to see that I just run the rules a few more times until I reach a new saturation point. But what if I retract some information that I had in the database, in the original database? Maybe some of the new things I derived are no longer valid. I wouldn't have been able to derive them anymore. So how do I deal with that? Um, yeah, and well, the migration of the data, which I was already mentioning about. And well, we still have some expressivity issues. This is a more powerful language, but actually it isn't a complete superset even of that QL language. It has some extra features, but actually we lost some features as well. Uh, so, well, I'm running a bit short of time, so I'm just going to finish by telling you about efficient implementation for this materialization engine, and then I'll skip over the remaining stuff, but you can look at that in the slides later. So how is this done? Well, existing approaches mainly target sort of shared nothing architectures, clusters, via map-reduced techniques. And this is very effective for some kinds of computation, but actually it's very ineffective for reasoning because typically there's very high communication overhead. Um, as you do these various different, this saturation involves you know, applying the rule again and again and again. So there may be huge numbers of mapping and reducing phases. Um, so overall, this just doesn't work very well. So what we've been doing is trying to look at some new techniques for building data log engines that use uh, techniques that are more effective for this particular application. And what we did, we looked at modern main memory multi-core architectures. So most of the computers we're using today, even our laptops, have more than one core in there. A typical desktop these days has at least eight, 16 maybe processing cores, can we use those to exploit and exploit the potential parallelization there? And also, we now have a lot of memory. So it's feasible to put even quite large databases in main memory. And if we do that, we can use some really different and more effective computational <laughs> techniques. So this is probably all a bit technical for you guys. So I'll just flip forward a bit. But we, we've developed a new system there. It exploits this multi-core architecture. So, for example, with um, 16 cores, we were able to get uh, up to 20 time speed up in the, in the, um, in the rate of, of doing this materialization, which might seem like a funny thing. How did we get getting using 16 cores? How did we get it to go 20 times faster? Hmm, sounds like something was a bit tricky there. But actually turns out that most of these processes also have a thing called hyperthreading. So each core has two kind of instruction pipelines. And if one core is processing away but it gets a memory stall because the thing you're trying to get is in the main memory and not in the local cache, that usually means it has to stop and wait for a while while stuff gets retrieved from the memory. But these guys have two of these pipelines and it just flips to the other pipeline and carries on processing that. So there's only 16 cores, but they can actually run 32 processing threads. And from that, we get a 20 times speed up. Okay, uh, we've got a, uh, another thing we built into the system was incremental reasoning. So, as I told you, addition is fairly easy, but retraction is more tricky. And basically, what we do here is we use a variation of view maintenance algorithms which were developed for databases. And this means that we can retract information very fast. So, withdrawing 5,000 facts from a fully materialized, extremely large data set, we can do that in less than a second. And the system has a ton of other novel features. It can handle actually a more expressive language than just this L2 RL. It handles more expressive query features in the rules. It handles equality reasoning. So one of the things that people often want to 
to do is assert that two different names are just different names for the same object, and this involves equality reasoning in logic, which is typically quite expensive. And it even handles a, a, a thing called negation as failure. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over this because I think I'm running out of time and I'll give you a chance to answer some... I uh, want to give you a chance to ask me some questions in case you have any. You can look at that in offline if you're interested. So, and just get to the discussion. Okay, so this... Query rewriting technique has many advantages. We can leave the data untouched in legacy data stores. It exploits database infrastructure and scalability, lots of other things. But it severely restricts the expressive power of the ontology language. And what if we mean, need more expressive power and flexibility? Well. Uh, as I've been mentioning, we can use this RL language. It's still theoretically tractable in that it's polynomial, but we critically depend then on scalable data log engines rather than you know, known scalable relational query answering engines. Uh, however, this does seem to work quite nicely in practice, and uh, hopefully uh, the systems that I'm describing can succeed in proving that logic and reasoning and scalability are not leading to a, a logical inconsistency. Lots of stuff still to do for the future. So we have systems now that work very well in, uh, in the lab, and we've even rolled these systems out in places like Statoil. So the architecture I was showing you in the Optique project that has been installed at Statoil and actually can answer queries over their real data stores actually quite efficiently, so they're fairly happy with that, but it still isn't part of the kind of critical path that they use when actually uh, doing um, sort of geological analyses. So we need more piloting, evaluation, tuning to make sure that's really working. Porting to different large-scale architectures. This in-memory business, it's okay. We have very large memories even on our laptops, but you know, obviously the data can always get larger than that, so what happens if the data overflows the amount of memory I've got? Well, then I'm going to have to have some sort of distributed architecture, so I need to find some way to make this run on a cluster. Lots of other stuff, more incremental maintenance. What about aggregation functions? That's actually a really complicated problem. Query planning, so currently we may, mainly use query planning techniques from relational databases, but that doesn't always work very well on these kinds of semantic store. Stream reasoning, I mentioned at the beginning about Siemens, important for them is data streaming from turbines. How does that fit in with this rewriting materialization approach? And what about perhaps some hybrid technique that tries to combine the advantages of both of these techniques? <coughs> and what if even this RL language isn't expressive enough for our purposes? Can we do anything if we really need the full power of OWL? Is there any way that we could have scalable reasoning over large data sets if we're really using this super expressive, double, non-deterministic, exponential language? And, well, we have a, a project that a student at Oxford was working on, and they built... She built a system called Pagoda uh, that actually does quite a nice job of answering uh, queries using the RL engine in a clever way that allows it to process queries that use the full expressive, the ontology, sorry, that use the full expressive power of OWL. And if uh, any of you are interested in that, I'd advise you to go and have a look at some of her papers, which uh, it was a very nice piece of work. Unfortunately, she's now gone off to, uh, to Google, so uh, she's working on something different. Okay, and I just wanted to finish off by saying, you know, what I was telling you about is obviously not my work, but the bunch of a, uh, work of a bunch of people that I've been, you know, lucky enough, very smart people I've been lucky enough to work with. Uh, and thank you for listening.
and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you, if you have them. Thanks. <laughs>